and comfort. And we praise your name for that. We pray that your spirit lead us as we go through uh, Leviticus and other scriptures. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> We're on Leviticus chapter 11. Now this chapter is one of the high points in scripture, but it's one of the most ignored chapters by the majority of the world. In Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, Elohim gives us explicit orders as to what is considered food and what is not considered food. Uh, Christianity for some 1,600 years has, has thought this chapter doesn't apply anymore and can and should be ignored. This chapter describes what has been called the Levitical diet. That's what it's called, the Levitical diet, but there's not a Levite mentioned here anywhere. Many uh, Christians point to the event where Peter was allegedly told uh, to call, uh, not to call certain animals unholy. And that's in Acts 10. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. We'll just go ahead and get this out of the way initially. Uh, this is what everyone points to. What about Peter's dream that, that says you can't call any food unholy? Um, that's, uh, it starts at verse 10 of Acts 10. And speaking of Peter, it says he became hungry and was desiring to eat. Uh, hence, this vision is going to strike a chord with him. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he beheld the sky opened up and a certain, a certain object like a great sheet coming down lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. Okay, uh, one thing I want to mention here. What kind of animals? All kinds, but in particular the animals. Four-footed, okay? So pigs weren't on it. They have hoofs. They don't have feet. Okay, so we're talking about mammals here. Uh, in particular, crawling, uh, we, we have maybe possums on there. We have raccoons. We have bears. That's the type of thing that's on that. Crawling creatures of the earth, centipedes, snakes, or not snakes, yeah, snakes, uh, spiders, birds of the air, vultures, crows. Okay, that's what he's seeing on there. It's not, as some people think, well, uh, he's got shrimp and, and scallops and, and pork roast on there. No, no, no. Yeah, uh-huh. None of those things. Verses 13 and 14, a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Master, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. <clears throat> uh, so he says, No, he doesn't eat anything. All right? And by the way, he was being, well, this, was, this, is a, uh, this is a punishment for Peter. This was a chastisement is what it was. Uh, we had the same thing happen with Ezekiel. And uh, at the time, uh, Israel's being punished, or Judas, excuse me, is being punished. And in order to demonstrate this, how they're going to, uh, be, how they're going to suffer, Ezekiel was told to eat uh, bread that's cooked over human feces as fuel. <coughs> and we're told in Ezekiel 4, starting at verse 10, And your food... Which you eat shall be twenty shekels a day by weight. You shall eat it from time to time. And the water you drink will be a sixth part of a hen by measure. You shall drink it from time to time. You shall eat it as a barley cake, having baked it in their sight over human dung. Then Yahweh said, Thus shall the sons of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations where I shall banish them. But I said, Oh, Adonai Yahweh, behold, I've never been defiled, for from my youth until now I've never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor has any clean meat ever, unclean meat ever entered my mouth. Then he said to me, See, I shall give you cow's dung in place of human dung over which you will prepare your bread. See, that was a chastisement against Israel. Okay, this, this command to eat something unclean. <clears throat> and then Elohim said, Okay, we won't use the human dung. You can use cow's dung to, uh, as fuel there. Well, this is a chastisement of Peter also in the same way, huh? Uh, what, cook, well, it's fuel. It's just for the fuel. Yeah, I know it doesn't sound very appealing, does it? But it's, uh, it's uh, let's say, not as bad. 
Going back to Acts 10, and again a voice came to him a second time. She said, this is a chastisement. What Elohim has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. So this, uh, this vision of this, this sheet coming down with four-footed animals, crawling creatures, and, and vultures on it, uh, he, said, Arise, he said, kill and eat. And he said, I, <laughs> no, I, I don't eat those things. Well, it happened three times. And then the object was taken up, and it disappeared. <clears throat> and the, the message was, what Elohim has cleansed, do not consider unholy. By the way, the, the term longer is not there. It's, it was added. Yeah. Right. As long as you bless it. That's what right. Uh, you can have sex with a prostitute as long as you pray first. So it's the same logic. Same logic. Yeah. Well, so Elohim will bless that, right? You can. You can murder somebody, but if you pray first, it's quite all right. Maybe I should use that instead as a <laughs> reference. But that was just the first thing popped into my mind. <clears throat> Verse 17, now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision he had seen might be. So we got Peter here, just had his vision. He has no idea what it means. No idea what it means. He's perplexed. Behold, the men who had seen, been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. Verse 18, and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. That's why this occurred three times, okay? Because three men are coming to get him. They're Gentiles, by the way. But arise, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. So he's told, just do what they say. All right, I sent for these guys. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for which you've come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and Elohim-fearing man, was well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So Peter is being sent. See, this guy, the centur this, uh, Cornelius, this, a centurion, was, was given a vision. To ask for you, because you have something to say to him. Verse 23, so he invited them in and gave them lodging. And on the next day he arose and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. So they're, they're waiting on him. He's, they know he's coming. And when it came about that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. And he talked with him. He entered and found many people assembled. Cornelius knew that Peter was an important guy. <clears throat> but he continues in verse 28, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner. Okay, it's unlawful by Jewish law for a Jew to associate with a, um, uh, a foreigner, a, a Gentile. Why is that? They're considered them unclean, right. They considered the Gentile unclean, uncircumcised, unclean. <clears throat> and yet Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without raising any objection when I was sent for, and so I asked for what reason you have sent for me. That was what that vision stated. Now what, does, uh, what do animals represent in Scripture? Normally Gentile nations. Remember Daniel's dream he had of the four creatures? Um, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, you're calling Gentiles unclean, and my, my breath is within them. You can't call them that. <clears throat> so, that's the whole message. It has nothing to do with what to eat. It had to do with uh, the attack on the rules, that, uh, the Pharisaic rules that declare Gentiles unclean. That's what that's referring to. It has nothing whatsoever to do with dietary laws or the Torah. 
<clears throat> Remember uh, when Yeshua said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person? Or it is what goes, it's not what goes into the mouth, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person, right? You see, now, that's the other one that's brought up. That is, uh, that is an attack really on more Pharisaic rules of hand washing in particular, is what this was. This is in Matthew 15. And starting at verse 1, we read, Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Yeshua from Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, And why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of Elohim for the sake of your tradition? For Elohim said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever shall say to his father or mother anything of mine you might might have been helped by, has been given to Elohim. He is not to honor his father or his mother. So the rule was, if you give the money to the, to the Pharisees, uh, then you have to give it to mom and dad to help, help them in their old age. Well, Yeshua said, uh-huh. You invalidated the word of Elohim for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And after he called the multitude to him, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what enters into the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds out of his mouth, out of the mouth, this defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? So he's saying, Whether or not you wash your hands before you eat doesn't defile you. And he's saying that uh, it's what comes out of their mouths is what is defiling them and will defile you. And he said the Pharisees were offended. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they're blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. And Peter answered and said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. These defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. But don't ever stop reading there. Go to one more verse. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. That's all he's referring to are the Pharisaic traditions of hand washings. Um, Mark chapter 7 goes into that also. It leaves off that last phrase, though. It's important to go to Matthew to get that last phrase to realize he's still talking about the hand washings. Okay? <clears throat> hmm? They don't keep reading either. Right. But they don't keep reading. They stop. See, we don't, we're not obedient to the Father by looking at little buzz phrases in Scripture. Okay, that doesn't tell, that doesn't tell the story. Um, what is probably the most famous, most quoted passage in Scripture? What do you think it is? Everyone has their opinion. John 3.16. Okay, let's get away from John 3.16. One more, just a phrase, a phrase that probably the most Commonly, close, let he was without sin cast the first stone. That's the one I've heard the most, I think, in my life. Yeah, it's not even in the Bible. Yeah, it's not even in there. <laughs> yeah, it's not in any of the ancient transcripts. It, it, was in, it was inserted centuries later, that whole thing about the woman caught in adultery. But uh, keep in mind, Yeshua is saying it's not a sin to not wash your hands before you eat. And by the way, this, this uh, uh, hand washing is not about getting your hands clean. You're supposed to have your hands clean and washed before you do this ritual hand washing. All right, it is a tradition that they do. And you go through and you pour water on, with your right hand onto the left three times and onto the right three times, and then you wrap the hand. I don't, it's, it's a ritual, okay? A certain way of doing it. And there are Messianic groups that do that. I mean, after they read the Torah and half Torah and the Brit Hadashah portion, they go and have potluck or whatever, they'll stand in line and do the hand washing first. 
I, I don't know. But people use a phrase or two from Paul's letters to justify their sinful habits of eating poisonous things. Peter warned us against using Paul's letters to justify our lawlessness. And this is in 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 13. This is the only place in Scripture where we receive a warning about another part of Scripture. And it's very, it's very much needed. Starting at verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. He said, okay, he's, gonna, he's coming. There's a new heavens and a new earth coming. Messiah is returning. You need to be in peace, spotless and blameless. What does that mean? Follow his Torah. Do what he says in his word. All right? Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, okay, as I say, be diligent, be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our master to be salvation. Verse 15, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. So he's saying, just like Paul wrote to you, be blameless, spotless, sinless, be obedient to the Torah. According to the wisdom given him, he wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. And if you read 2 Peter, he talks a lot about don't sin. Be obedient to the Father's word over and over again. He said Paul's letter speaks, speaks about these things too. Then he continues in verse 16, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. He said, now Paul tells you to be sinless and to be obedient to the word, to, to be obedient to the Torah. But some of these things, Peter says, it's hard to understand what he's saying. I know what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the, the letter to the Galatians more, more than anything. And he said that these people that are untaught and unstable, they distort this. They distort Paul's letters. They distort all the scriptures to their own destruction. You, therefore, verse 17, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest, being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfast, steadfastness. That does not mean unprincipled men. It means lawless. It's a thesmos. The A in front of it means no. It means lawless. Lest being carried away by the error of lawless men, you fall from your own steadfastness. Okay, be careful with Paul's letters. That's, that's what he says. Be careful with them. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, you know, uh, most people ignore these dietary laws because they think they can cook out all the viruses, the bacteria, and the parasites that are in unclean things. Dr. Russell, Dr. Rex Russell, uh, in his book, he was, a, he was a friend of mine. His book he wrote was What the Bible Says About Healthy Living. It gives a wonderful defense of the scriptural diet. If we think modern science has shown how we can safely cook many foods that Elohim has declared unclean, uh, we are delusional. <clears throat> there are many foods eaten daily that are toxic to our bodies and they're toxic to our souls. Dr. Uh, Russell gave the example of the puffer fish. Now, the puffer fish, very interesting. If you eat just a small amount of it and it's not prepared just right, you will be dead within a few minutes. It is a delicacy in Japan. Puffer fish. Uh, if you just eat a little bit of it, if it's not prepared just right, and there are, there are chefs in Japan that are trained to prepare this just right so that everyone who eats it won't just die right away. Now, would you want some? No, why would I want some of that? <laughs> why would I want some of that? The Japanese consider it a delicacy, though. <clears throat> it's definitely not worth the gamble. But, you know, it's a gamble we take on our present diets also. Many of the unclean animals we eat cause hepatitis, cholera, and other deadly and crippling diseases. 
but we try to tell ourselves, oh, that Leviticus diet, that doesn't matter anymore. That doesn't matter anymore. To disregard dietary commands in Scripture will not only shorten your lifespan, but this type of intentional disobedience will prevent one from knowing the Father. Let's look at the first two verses in Leviticus 11. Yahweh spoke again to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. See, you see, uh, Elohim in his word, he delineates for us what is right and what is wrong, what is light, what is dark, what is clean, what is unclean. Elohim is the one that makes the difference between light and darkness. He wants us to love what is good and hate what is evil. So with mankind, on the other hand, we want to do just the opposite. We want everything to be vague. We want everything to be various shades of gray, don't we? We don't want this to be right and that to be wrong. We want everything to be kind of in between. <clears throat> so we try to deceive ourselves with terms like diversity, tolerance, identity politics, acceptance, and then apply those things to the sins that are in society. Okay, that's what we want to do. We've got to remember, we're not capable of determining what's right and what's wrong in and of ourselves. <clears throat> we're not capable of defining sin for ourselves. We can't do it. Elohim has to do that for us. You know, what, mankind's definition of morality would be no morality. Now, if you're an evolutionist and you believe we're all just... Uh, Evolved bags of chemicals. What's wrong with two bags of chemicals slapping against each other? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with one bag of chemicals cutting open the other bag of chemicals and watching all the chemicals running out? What's that? What's wrong with that? Nothing. So, and what's, what's wrong with two bags of chemicals doing a bunch of immoral things? Nothing. None of your business. You keep your eyes and your bag of chemicals away from, away from mine and keep your, your mouth a bag of chemicals shut. Okay? Well, I mean, that's what we've taught our kids. We're just rearranged pond scum. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what we're teaching them. So how, how could there be right and wrong? Who determines what's right or wrong? What, you, if you go into the animal kingdom? I saw that leopard kill that elk. Was that wrong? No. <clears throat> and if that's all we are, then who are we to say that someone else is wrong? Well, you know what? A higher power needs it. If you have a room full of two-year-olds, what'll happen? Here, two-year-olds go on in there. Total chaos. They'll be yelling, screaming in absolutely no time. There'll be, there'll be blood, messy diapers. There'll be stuff everywhere, right? But what do they need? They need a higher power to go in there and keep an eye on them, make sure they're not doing the wrong things because they're not capable of understanding what's the right or wrong th things at that age. What do we need? We need a higher power that tells us what's right and what's wrong because we're not capable of determining that for ourselves because everyone will have a different answer, won't you? Every one of us will have different ideas as to what's right and what's wrong to where right and wrong don't really exist. <coughs> Well, um, we have to eat, heed Elohim's commands as to what we should and should not eat. This chapter focuses on the negative. Leviticus 11, uh, 11 focuses, don't eat these things. Deuteronomy 14, which is the second witness to the dietary laws, pretty much focuses on what we should eat instead of what we shouldn't eat. <clears throat> Both chapters are necessary to establish the two witnesses and determine truth. Verse 3, whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hoofs, and chews the cud among the animals, that you may eat. Now this is the rule to determine uh, what land animals to eat and not to eat. Only those animals that chew the cud and have a split hoof are clean for food. Now this eliminates carnivorous animals uh, because they don't chew the cud. Only plant-eating animals do. Deuteronomy lists the following animals as clean, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the hart, the roebuck, the fallow deer, and some others whose identity is kind of difficult to determine. 
Now, cows fit in this category. The digestive tract of a cow has bacteria that help digest uh, grasses and grains. This bacteria also crowd out harmful bacteria, viruses, and parasites. The digestive system of a cow produces healthy nutrients to its flesh, and it protects the flesh from harmful toxins. The fact of the matter is Elohim designed a cow to be used as food. <clears throat> Verses 4 through 6. Nevertheless, you are not to eat of these, among those which chew the cud or among those which divide the hoof. The camel, for though it chews cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. Likewise, the rock badger, for though it chews cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. The rabbit also, for though it chews a cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. Okay, the... Uh, Rock badger, or depending on your translation, or coney, or rock hyrax in other uh, translations, is the uh, Hebrew word shafen. And it's an unknown animal, so they inserted the word rock badger in there. So they'll do that sometimes. If they're not sure what it is, they'll think of something that they can relate it to today and, and just insert that in there. The Hebrew word arnabeth is translated as hare and rabbit. But it's not a hare or rabbit because hares and rabbits don't chew the cud. They appear to. You know, the little mouth, cute mouths moving around. But no, they're not chewing the cud. So it's probably some creature that's now extinct. We don't know what it was. The message here is that only land animals that were created for food are those which chew the cud and have the split hoof. Verse 7. And the pig, for though it divides the hoof, thus making it a, a split hoof, it does not chew the cud. It is unclean to you. Pigs are filthy. They are unclean animals. These things, yeah, they get huge in the wild. <clears throat> Elohim created them to clean up our environment. Okay? The city of Philadelphia has used pigs for the last hundred years to eat a lot of the trash in their landfill. Okay, it reduces the waste stream. Now, um, <laughs> look at these things. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a hog. Woo pig suey. Yeah, uh, there's a landfill. That, you see, to feed, the, to feed the hogs in the landfill is a great idea. It's it's really an awesome idea because uh, I worked. Uh, I was an engineer, and one of our clients was the uh, Southeastern Public Service Authority, which was the landfill for Norfolk, Suffolk, uh, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, uh, the big cities down there for one and a half to two million people, one landfill. You know how much trash in one day they had every day? 4,000 tons every day of trash. What do you do with all that? 4,000 tons. I don't care how big a landfill you got, it's going to fill up. Okay, then what do you do with it after it's filled up? Well, you... <laughs> well, it's already buried. See, what they do is they'll dump it out, and before they bury it, they'll have the hogs eat on it. Uh, like I said, that's a good idea. Then, uh, then, not only that, you get a lot of your trash gets broken down that way. Which, uh, trash in a landfill, I mean, the, the, there's been uh, some excavations done in landfills to where they found a steak wrapped in a, a newspaper from 1920. And it was still a steak. So what do you do? We have a trash problem. Uh, pigs are one good answer to help that. <clears throat> but pigs are garbage disposals that Elohim created to clean up the trash and poisons in the world. And Yeshua used pigs as a dumping ground to throw demons. Remember that? In Matthew 8, starting in verse 28, and when he had come to the other side in the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so exceedingly violent that no one could pass by that road. And behold, they cried out, saying, What do we do with you, son of Elohim? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was at a distance from them a herd of many swine feeding. And the demons began to entreat him, saying, If you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. 
<coughs> and he said to them, Be gone. And they went out and went into the swine. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. Now, the digestive tract of a pig is entirely different than that of a cow. Pigs are so gluttonous, they don't stop eating. Okay, they don't stop eating. That causes a dilution of the stomach acid, and many of the poisonous bacteria and parasites that enter the stomach of a pig are absorbed into the flesh. <clears throat> These same toxins and infectious poisons can be transmitted to humans by eating that flesh. In this country, three of the six most common infectious parasitic diseases come from eating pork. Congratulations. In Japan, these same diseases come from eating the flesh of pigs, horses, bears, raccoons, and foxes. These are all animals that Elohim called unclean. Now, one scientist at the University of uh, Neeson's Institute for Virology in Germany showed that pigs are the one animal which can serve as a mixing vessel for new influenza viruses that may threaten world health. A pig will mix DNA viruses from other creatures like birds and humans and create a whole new DNA virus that could be lethal to humans. Virologists have concluded that if we don't separate humans from pigs, the whole Earth's population could be at risk. <clears throat> now, um, in case you're not familiar with neurocysticercosis, I'm going to make you familiar with neurocysticercosis. And I'm going to keep saying neurocysticercosis because I learned how to say it, and I'm proud of myself. It took me a while. <clears throat> I could even spell it, but I'm not going to do it in front of you because I'll mess it up. But this is an article from the Huffington Post. You've heard of disgusting 20-foot-long tapeworms living inside people's intestines. But it turns out their larvae are even more horrific, and they could be eating holes in your brain right now undetected. Brain tapeworms, or neurocysticercosis, are a parasitic disease of the nervous system, and Discover Magazine had an interesting and vomit-inducing expose on the problem this week. Basically, brain tapeworms, larvae that can attach themselves to the cranium in the form of large white cysts, are the result of a wrong turn. The larvae are accustomed to traveling through a pig's bloodstream and attach themselves to its muscles. But when a human eats undercooked pork, there's a chance he or she could be eating un undercooked tapeworm larva as well. And this is your brain on pork. See all the holes in it? Okay, those things will travel through your bloodstream up into your brain, attach themselves in there. Now, don't get me wrong, a beef tapeworm is a problem too, but there ain't nothing like this. This is only from pork. <clears throat> The magazine reported that Maryland's Dr. Theodore Nash sees patients with horrible side effects caused by tapeworm brain damage. Some fall into comas while others lose motor functions, experience violent seizures, or go blind. Worse, the affliction is more common than you might think. It's difficult to track exactly how many people have them because the tapeworms thrive in areas of the world with poor sanitation and less extensive health care networks. Nash estimates upward of 2,000 people have them in the United States. I say baloney. Uh, one, one, they interviewed one doctor in a Philadelphia hospital. He said, well, we've had 200 cases this year. So don't tell me there's only 2,000. And that was in one hospital, but from one doctor in Philadelphia. So don't tell me there's 2,000 in the country. Uh, Lewis, who isn't here, says now uh, if, uh, if they get... Uh, someone that's disoriented in the emergency room now. That's one of the first things they look for if they're badly disoriented. <laughs> of Hispanic uh, uh, descent in particular, because it seems to be the case. <clears throat> he says 29 million people or more have them in Latin America alone. 29 million. So there you go. Any questions on neurocysticercosis before I move on? Anybody want to try and say it? <laughs> Think pig tapeworm. That's all you got to remember. Pig tapeworm. Verse 11 of Leviticus 11. 
You shall not eat of their flesh nor touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. Elohim is warning us against the harmful effects of bacteria and microscopic parasites that come from dead animals. You know, Elohim knew that he didn't want to give us a microbiology class 4,000 years ago, okay? He didn't want to do that. So what does he do? He tells us what to do and what not to do. When you have a, a three-year-old in the kitchen and he wants to touch the hot stove, what does mom, does mom, you see, some mothers will stop and say, now, honey, uh, this, this big box here converts electrical energy into heat energy. And that heat energy will blister your little hand. Or do you just say, no, don't touch the stove? Which is it? No, no don't touch the stove, okay? Well, Elohim said, no, don't touch these things. So don't do it. Don't do it. <clears throat> he just wants us to obey him. That's all he wants us to do. All right? In Exodus 15, verse 26, we read, And he, he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, Yahweh, am your healer. Why did the Egyptians have all those diseases? You know, they've analyzed the uh, mummified remains from ancient Egypt. There, there was hundreds and hundreds of them. And Dr. Russell pointed that out in his book. You know, they suffer from the same illnesses and problems that we in Americans have today. <clears throat> the same, they had the same digestive problems. They had the same venereal diseases. They had the same blah that we have today that we're dying of. What's that? Yeah, things haven't changed much. But he says, if you do what I say... Those diseases, you won't get those diseases. All right? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Uh, and we're going to get to the, uh, the, the, the sexual chapters in Leviticus, too. They're going to tell us, don't do, do this, don't do that. Don't, don't ever do that, and that, and that, and that. And that's all we seem to be doing are those things that he said not to do. And they're glorified. We glorify each other for them. It's, it's, it's horrifying what we do. <clears throat> like, for instance, do you think, uh, what do you think we're doing to people's lives when we encourage homosexuality the way we are? What's the average lifespan for a homosexual man, for instance? It's about, it's about mid-50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lot of controversy on that, but that's, that's how it appears to be. It's going to be a short life. It's going to be a miserable life. Um, but we, we seem to glorify it for some stupid reason. Verses 9 and 10. These you may eat, whatever is in the water, all that have fins and scales. Those in the water, in the seas, or in the rivers, you may eat. But whatever is in the seas and in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, among all the teeming life in the water, and among all the living creatures that are in the water, they are detestable to you. Now this is the rule for creatures in the water. You can eat everything that has fins and scales. Yeshua himself even mentioned this in Matthew 13, verses 47 and 48. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And granted, this is a parable, but he says, and when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. Well, what would be the bad fish? Yeah, unclean ones, right. <clears throat> like that. Okay, you know, where, you know where this guy got this? That's two pictures of him. You know where he caught this? In a pond. He caught that in a pond. <clears throat> Verses 11 and 12. And they shall be abhorrent to you. You may not eat of their flesh, and their carcasses you shall detest. Whatever in the water does not have fins and scales is abhorrent to you. That includes shellfish. You know, we lived in Virginia Beach for several years. There were numerous raw oyster bars there, and you, there wouldn't be a month go by where another rep, uh, uh, restaurant in the area uh, was shut down for hepatitis. 
Okay, it just always happened. Shellfish are notorious carriers of cholera. Shellfish can be placed in a body of water that, that's contaminated with cholera, cholera bacteria, and in a few hours that water will be clean. All the bacteria will be gone. Where'd it go? It went in the shellfish. Okay, that's what they're for. Elohim created shrimp, oysters, crabs, scallops, and mussels to purify water from chemicals, toxins, harmful bacteria, parasites, and viruses. Um, there's a, uh, we don't live in a Bay Area, but if you ever have, they'll talk about the, the uh, crisis of pollution in bays. And then always talk about how bad it is. It's, they'll, uh, they'll try to blame farm, run off of farmers' pesticides and stuff like that for the bad pollution. You know what the problem is in those bays? The harvesting of shellfish. Harvesting all the shellfish out of there. That's when they cleaned up down there in the, the petroleum spill. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was that type of thing that it cleaned up itself. It will clean up itself. That's what it's for. It's what they're for. Well, they're saying at Plymouth Rock, when the pilgrims landed there, there's so many of these nasty uh, big cockroach, water cockroach-looking things that we call lobsters now, all over the place. They were stacked high. They didn't know what to do with them. I guess they started eating them, huh? Well, they don't, not many of them run wild and free anymore, especially on the beaches. Oh, yum, yum. <clears throat> and they, say, they, they, they carry the same... Um, the same type of, of uh, body mass structure content as a cockroach. Okay, some of, the, some of the same DNA type is in there. Yum. Boy, that's a delicacy, isn't it? <clears throat> the state, of, uh, state legislature of California proposed a law warning this food may be hazardous to your health in all seafood restaurants. They proposed that legislation. It didn't get passed. But you know why? There, there are at least 50 deaths due to the ingestion of shellfish in restaurants every year in California. <clears throat> Catfish also fall into that category of that unclean fish. They're scavengers. They are bottom dwellers that clean the water. For example, one day a peach farmer sprayed his crop for pesticides and a huge rain immediately followed. The rain runoff drained the insecticide into his pond that was stocked with various fish. The catfish did what they're supposed to do. They ate the insecticide. They all went belly up. But all the fish that had fins and scales, they were fine. You know why? They didn't eat it. Catfish do. Toxic blooms are caused by algae that produce toxins that can cause massive fish kills, marine mammal deaths, and human illness. In many cases, oh, there it is, toxic blooms are caused by algae that produce potent toxins that can cause massive fish kills, marine mammal deaths, and human illness. In many cases, the toxins can be transported through the food web to humans, often through contaminated shellfish. <clears throat> Excuse me, the toxins can impact humans in different ways, leading to mild symptoms or even death. The toxins cause many illnesses, including uh, ciguatera fish poisoning, diuretic shellfish poisoning, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, paralytic shellfish poisoning, and amnesic shellfish poisoning. Which one of those do you want? I didn't know how many times, how many did. I had no idea. There's so many different types of shellfish poisoning. Isn't that interesting? And actually, those are just the broad categories of them. They probably have a lot of good uh, exotic different types. Consumer Reports tested fish bought in multiple markets in the United States. Fish is considered spoiled when bacteria counts exceed 10 million per gram of flesh. Okay? Bacteria count of 10 million per gram of, of flesh that's contaminated fish. Now, except for catfish, they have to go on a different scale because t uh, catfish uh, that they tested at 27 million bacteria per gram, even when properly prepared. Three times what they consider other fish to be spoiled is good enough for catfish because you can't do any better. Okay? 
Yum. Yum. <clears throat> Pigs clean up the land. Shellfish and catfish clean up the water. Do you want to eat what they clean up? The flesh of these creatures re retains much of the parasites, toxins, bacteria, and infections that they ingest. <clears throat> Verse 13, these moreover you shall detest among the birds. They are abhorrent, not to be eaten. The eagle and the vulture and the buzzard, and the kite and the falcon and its kind, every raven and its kind. Uh, what, do, what, do the, what do these birds clean up? Dead animals, yeah, and, they, and, and rodents. And the ostrich and the owl and the seagull and the hawk and its kind. And the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the white owl and the pelican and the carrion vulture. And the stork and the heron and its kinds and the hoopoe. I, I would never eat a hoopoe. <laughs> Tastes like chicken, yeah. <laughs> and the bat. Okay, and the bat, okay. And I, uh, I remember uh, online you get these people wanting to mock scripture all the time. It said, the Bible says the bat is a bird. Leviticus eleven nineteen. See, it says the bat is a bird. And I just typed in there. And I said, well, you know, if you're going to put it in the category, it puts it in the category of birds, yeah. We are a lot smarter than that. We put it in the category of cows. <laughs> okay? We're a lot smarter, aren't we? <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're not, this is not trying to teach us bio, biological uh, families. That's not what this, the, the purpose of this. It's, a, yeah, right, they're all predators, aren't they? Uh-huh. Yep, these are all the dirty birdies. <laughs> Verses 20 and 21, all the winged insects that walk at all fours are detestable to you. Yet these you may eat among all the winged in insects which walk on all fours, those which have above their feet jointed legs with which to jump on the earth. <clears throat> um, the implication here is that insects with four or more legs will be unclean. Um, grasshoppers and crickets, they have four legs and then two jumping legs. Okay, uh, They have little scurrying legs, but then the big hoppers, they have the, the two the two big legs. <clears throat> Verse 22. These of them you may eat, the locust and its kinds, and the devastating locust and its kinds, and the cricket and its kinds, and the grasshopper and its kinds. And I heard you can put them in stuffed mushrooms. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> where, where is he? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know, crickets are good for whatever he's ailing me. Okay. <clears throat> um, you can safely eat these insects. John the Baptist had the correct diet when he came out of the wilderness. Matthew 3, verse 4. Now John himself had a garment of coat's hair, or excuse me, camel's hair, and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Well, there you go. Verse 23 of Leviticus 11. But all other winged insects which are four-footed are detestable to you. Now there are 11 main types of locusts known to exist, but only certain types are clean. And if anyone's interested in researching which ones are clean and which ones are unclean, um, go ahead and do the research. Okay? And I'll, I'll back you all the way. I, for one, don't care. I don't think I'm going to eat the good locusts and avoid the bass. I'm just going to play the locust thing safe. <clears throat> there you go. That look, look good? Verses 24 and 25. By these, moreover, you will be made unclean. Whoever touches their carcasses becomes unclean until evening. And whoever picks up any of their carcasses shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcasses of dead, dead insects are unclean. Touching them makes one unclean until evening. Verse 26. Concerning all the animals which divide the hoof but do not make a split hoof. Or which do not chew, uh, chew cud, they are unclean to you. Whoever touches them becomes unclean. Also, whatever walks in its paws among all the creatures that walk on all fours are unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcasses becomes unclean until evening. And the one who picks up their carcasses shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. They are 
unclean to you. Dead carcasses of dead animals, of unclean animals, excuse me, are especially dangerous. Dead flesh quickly picks up disease and bacteria, and if it's an unclean creature, they're already filled with it. So it multiplies quickly. Elohim's provision for someone infected is for them to wash themselves and wash their clothes. You know, what is the best way to prevent communicable diseases? And washing. Clean clothes and clean body. Wasn't that amazing? See, it said it 4,000 years ago, too. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, buffalo. I think buffalo's clean. Yeah, bison. Bison are clean. Yeah, right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think giraffes are clean, too. No, I haven't eaten any giraffe. I, I, that may be frowned upon nowadays. I don't know. <clears throat> Verse 29. Now, these are to you the unclean among the swarming things which swarm on the earth. The mole, the mouse, and the great lizard in its kinds. And the gecko, and the crocodile, and the lizard, and the sand reptile, and the chameleon. These are to you the unclean among all the swarming things. Whoever touches them when they're dead becomes unclean until evening. These little varmints are unclean also. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, the important thing here is not the obvious, especially if you look into it, the obvious health uh, advice that you're getting here. That's not the important thing. The important thing is to do what Elohim says. Obedience is the key. Okay? If you have your obedient three-year-old child and you say, no, don't ever touch that stove, and he never does, he got you a good one. Okay? He's going to listen to mom and dad. He's obedient. He's faithful to what they say. That's great stuff. We're told in Isaiah that eating pig's flesh is as bad of a sin as worshiping the dead. In Isaiah 65, starting at verse 1, we read, I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I to a nation which did not call on my name. I spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way which is not good, following their own thoughts, a people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens, burning incense on bricks, who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of unclean meat is in their pots. Who say, you know, he's saying here, you got to look at what he's saying here. Those that eat swine's flesh <clears throat> and the broth of unclean meat, clam chowder, let's say. You know what you're saying to Elohim? Here's what you're saying to him. This is what Elohim says you're saying to him. Keep to yourself. Don't you come near me. I'm holier than you are. That's what we're saying to him, right to his face. He's saying that these people continually provoke me to my face. That's what you're saying to the Father. Ah, he doesn't care about what I eat. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day. Behold, it's written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will even repay into their bosom. What's the number one killer? And you, heart disease. What do you know? Due to what? They're probably not going to admit it. They're probably not going to admit it, but it's a diet. Elohim says those who eat swine's flesh and unclean things and broth at judgment, you're going to be totally annihilated. That's in Isaiah 66. Verse 16. For Yahweh will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those slain by Yahweh will be many. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens, following one in the center, who eat swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice, shall come to an end altogether, says Yahweh. Who's going to annihilate them? That judgment. They're going to get annihilated. Any questions on that? Yeah, once again, I didn't say it. 
You blame Isaiah. He wrote it, yeah. For eating unclean things, that, that's correct. The, the, uh, the Hebrew word is tobah. And it's in Deuteronomy 14, not Leviticus 11. So that's why we didn't bring that up. But that same word used to describe eating unclean things, tobah, is an abomination. It's translated as, as other words too. But the same word is, is used to describe homosexual sex, tobah. Okay? There you go. That's what the father thinks of it. Verse 32, also anything on which one of them may fall when they're dead becomes unclean, including any wooden article or clothing or skin or sack, any article which is made, it shall be put in the water and be unclean until evening, then it becomes clean. You know, it's commonplace for a rodent to be found in the kitchen, but if it's found dead, the surface has to be cleaned with water and then set out to the sun to dry for a day. A yeah, no, not the rodent. The thing it dies on. <laughs> this applies to wood, clothing, cloth, or skin. Uh, these are things that will absorb the disease and infection. Elohim is telling the Israelites how to kill bacteria 3,800 years ago. Yeah, wash it and set it out in the sun. Yeah, UV does it. This is no mistake. These things are not mistakes or luck. They're not luck. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Verse 33, as for any earthenware vessel into which, uh, which one of them may fall, whether, uh, whatever it is in becomes unclean, and you shall break the vessel. Okay, that's inside the vessel. The sunlight can't get to it. All right, so you can clean it, wash it out, but the sunlight can't get into it. And clay pottery back then, it wasn't glazed. It would quickly absorb the bacteria and the infection. So you've got to break it and throw it away. You find a, a dead rat in it. In it. <clears throat> Verses 34 and 35. Any of the food which may be eaten on which water comes shall become unclean. Any liquid which may be drunk in every vessel shall become unclean. Everything moreover on which part of their carcass may fall becomes unclean. An oven or a stove shall be smashed. Their uncleanness shall continue as unclean to you. The vessels and appliances are declared unclean if they find a dead rat inside. That's only good medical standard. Elohim is merely protecting them from disease and death. Deuteronomy 7, verse 15, And Yahweh will remove from you all sickness, and he'll not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt, which you've known, and he will lay them, lay them on all who hate you. There you go. <clears throat> um, you know, in the, a lot of the uh, hospitals of several hundred years ago in Europe, the infant mortality rate was not very high. And what they would do <clears throat> is deliver one baby after another. You know, wouldn't wash or anything. Because, you know, you don't have to listen to Leviticus if you're a Christian. Because you don't have to listen to that. Therefore, you don't have to wash your hands after you deliver babies and deliver more and deliver more. And why are these babies all dying? Why are so many of them dying? And then it was the, at the Jewish places where babies are born, guess what? They weren't dying at near that rate because they feel, they feel burdened by the law. Okay? They have to carry that heavy burden of doing what the law says. So they always wash blood off. They always wash their hands. A lot of washing in, in uh, Torah, if you'll notice that. So, what did the Christians do? Uh, essentially said the Jews were poisoning their wells and that's why the kids were dying. Or something like that. Blame the Jews instead of uh, trying to imitate them. But, you know, as a, uh, the Christians in the day didn't have to obey the law, so they didn't have to wash their hands. <clears throat> and he says, Yahweh will remove from you all these sicknesses. 
and won't give you those harmful diseases, but I'm going to lay them all on those who hate you. What does he mean by those who hate you? Those who hate the Jews and their ways. Those who hate Israel and their ways. You, they get the disease. No, the diseases aren't working, real, aren't working out real well for them, are they? Verse 36. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern collecting water shall be clean, though the one who touches their carcass shall be unclean. If a dead rat is found in a well or a cistern, the water is not contaminated. The water in a well or cistern is running water. It purifies itself. A dead carcass and the disease of bacteria in them will be filtered out by natural processes. Naturally, get the dead rat out of there. Well, my wife would make me get the dead rat out of there. I know she wouldn't. She can't take the mice and rats thing. <clears throat> yeah, my wife, she sees a rat or a mouse. She's a stereotype right away. Bless her heart. Verses 37 and 38. And if a part of their carcass falls on any seed or sowing, which is to be sown, it's clean. Though if water is put on the seed and a part of their carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. This is crazy, it's crazy insightful stuff here. Dry seed has a hard coating to protect it. So it won't be contaminated. But when water conditions seed, it makes it susceptible to impurity. This is 4,000 years ago. Verse 39, also, if one of the animals dies, which you have for food, the one who touches its carcass becomes unclean until evening. If a clean animal dies for some unknown reason, it's unclean. Okay? If you find a dead chicken laying in your yard, don't eat it. There's a reason why that chicken died. Probably some disease that could be transmitted through eating its flesh. Verse 40, he too who eats some of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And the one who picks up its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. Once again, if you get infected by a dead carcass, you are to wash yourself in your clothes and hang them to dry for a day. Why? That's how it's cleaned. That's how it's purified. He said so. Yeah, that's the main reason, because he said so. If we just do what he says, if we just do what he says. Verse 41, now every swarming thing that swarms on the earth is detestable, not to be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever walks on all fours, whatever uh, has many feet, in respect to every swarming thing that swarms on the earth, you shall not eat them, for they are detestable. Do not render yourselves detestable through any of the swarming things that swarm, and you shall not make yourselves unclean with them, so that you become unclean. <clears throat> Scripture says we render ourselves detestable by touching and eating unclean things. We render ourselves detestable. We defile ourselves with things we eat. We eat unclean things, we make ourselves unfit for the Father. Verse 44, For I am Yahweh your Elohim, consecrate yourselves therefore, and be holy, be set apart, for I am set apart. You shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. These rules given by Elohim, just like the rules of morality and sexual conduct, are there for your own good. They are there to be followed. They are there to give you life and give it, give it to you more abundantly. Not to spoil your fun or remove the foods you enjoy so you can now only eat locusts and wild honey. Okay? <clears throat> In verse 45, did it disappear? Yeah, let me read verse 45 to you. For I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your Elohim. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Says it two verses in a row. You shall be holy because I am holy. You are to be set apart from everybody else because he says I am set apart from everybody else. Be holy, be set aside for Elohim's use. Peter quoted this passage in reference to believers. 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. See, when we see the word lust, I remember as a Christian, I kept thinking, oh, that's a sex term. That's not what it's referring to at all. What uh, These things you lusted at in the way the, the things you ate. 
He says, but like the Holy One who called you, be your holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Where did he quote from? The dietary laws. You are to be set apart in all your behavior. Paul told us to avoid eating that which is unclean also. 2 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 14, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and has light with darkness? That's, I find that interesting there, the way he says this. Don't be bound together with unbelievers. What, what term does he tie to unbelievers? That term right there, lawlessness. Unbelievers are lawless ones. They're the ones that don't believe, per se. <clears throat> or what harmony has Messiah with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of Elohim with idols? For we are the temple of the living Elohim. And just as Elohim said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says Yahweh, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I'll be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says Adonai Yahweh. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. Perfecting holiness. What's that mean? Learning how to be set apart. Perfecting how to be set apart. See, I uh, recently writing that rebuttal that says this this guy says so many things like the the uh, other apostles don't write about following the Torah, but they don't look at words like um, holiness. Perfect holiness in what you do. Don't sin anymore. Practice righteousness. What do all those terms mean? Follow the Torah. They all mean the same thing. But they say, no, see, he doesn't say follow the Torah. Don't sin is the same thing. Sin no more is the same thing. Be righteous. Be holy for he, because he's holy. Same thing. And it's all, how are we so, how are we so conditioned to be blind to those terms? I, I, I went years, couldn't see it. Didn't see it. Right there in front of us. And lastly, verses 46 and 47, this is the Torah regarding the animal and the bird and every living thing that moves in the waters and everything that swarms on the earth to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, between the edible creature and the creature which is not to be eaten. This is only good sense. Medical science now knows that Elohim had excellent reasons for every one of these things he said. Every one of the things he just said in this chapter. It was for the health and long life of his people. He loves us greatly. We should praise his name for his rules. Any questions on Leviticus 14? Or excuse me, 11. Deuteronomy 14. Which we'll get to in about a year. <clears throat> okay, we're going to take a break and... This was a long chapter, and it's going to fit well with the end of Esther, which won't take very long. So let's take a break for five minutes. We'll come back and look at the last two chapters of Esther.